Hi everybody, Mark Fox here with Amazing Prophecies YouTube channel, Forever Free Ministries. If it's in the Bible, we want it. If it's not in the Bible, we don't want it. Most people will not go to heaven, not because they had no chance to go, but because they were not truly born again. Only those who are truly converted will go to heaven. People are not following in the footsteps of Jesus in true conversion. In this video, we will focus on 10 clear, compelling signs that you are truly born again, that you are truly converted. Get ready for 10 signs of true conversion. If you think you can handle the truth, then watch this. Stay tuned. But first, I want to get into your hands a free ebook called Mark of the Beast. Click on the link below. You'll be able to give a donation. It's greatly appreciated at this time, but not required. In addition to that, I want to get into your hands a large edition of the book, the bestseller book called Great Controversy. It covers topics like the mark of the beast, the seal of God, the second coming of Christ, the dark ages, destruction of Jerusalem, and the rise of the Antichrist, and much more. If you give a donation of $60, you can receive one book, $240, six books at $40 each, $420 at 12 books, $35 each. Donate by phone or donate by mail. The information is on the screen. In addition to that, if you need help to find a Seventh-day Sabbath keeping church near you, text us at 972-268-4555. Give us your name and city, or you can email us from around the world at amazingprophecies at gmail.com. Now let's get right into my topic. I'd like you to take your Bible and turn with me to John chapter 8. John chapter 8. We're going to look at several verses there to set the pace and tone for this specific message on 10 signs of true conversion. The marriage supper of the Lamb is coming, but only those who experience conversion will be sitting at that long banquet table. Can you tell me how long do you think that table is going to be? Quite long. How many are determined by God's grace to be sitting at that table? Amen? John chapter 8, looking there at verse 31 and onward. Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed in him, If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. John 8, 32. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you what, everybody? It'll make you free. They answered him, We are Abraham's descendants and have never been in bondage to anyone. How can you say you will be made free? Jesus answered them. Now listen to this. Jesus speaking. Most assuredly I say to you, whoever commits sin, uh oh, becomes a what? Becomes a slave of sin. And a slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. Read verse 36 with me together. Here we go. Therefore, if the Son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. Are you free? Do you know that you're free? Do you know that you know that you're free? Because Satan wants to convince you either one of two ways. Either A, to think you're free when you're not, or to try to convince you that you're not free when really you are. The devil doesn't want us to be free. I'm curious, on a scale of one to 10, how much do you want to know that you are free and that it's 100% sure? How, in a scale of one to 10, how much do you want to claim that you're free? One to 10. It's a 10, amen. So, you know, <laughs> When I was probably about, uh, I don't know, five years old, I was misbehaving. How you figure? So I, 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 was, I was misbehaving, and at the time I was one of three boys, then my baby brother came a, a, a longer after that. And I was misbehaving, I guess, with my brother Dana, he's younger than I, and we were visiting a pastor's friend, uh, my father, being a retired pastor at the time, is pastoring in New Jersey, Pennsylvania. And so he, and along with his family, went to visit this Baptist uh, pastor. And 
I was misbehaving and it was outside. I don't remember a lot. Come on, how much do you remember at the age of four or five? But I remember being outside and I was misbehaving. I think I made that clear. And he took me, hold of me, opened the car trunk and threw me in the car trunk and closed it. Do you think I remembered that? <laughs> All I could think about on a scale of one to 10, I want to be free. I want out of here. There's only one thing I could think about. I want out of here. It seemed like eternity. All I know, I can re recall, it was very dark. <laughs> Not only was it very dark, it was very claustrophobic. How many, besides myself, to this day have a little claustrophobia once in a while? Aren't you glad this is a big room? And so, after an eternity pass, and I'm crying my eyes out, the trunk opens. Freedom. What do you think I thought about that Baptist pastor? Not too happy about that. To this day, my parents are like, I can't believe he did that. Not saying all Baptist pastors are like that, but I'm just saying. Fast forward. At this next episode, I'm probably about six years old. And once again, I'm with our, you know, we're with my dad. He's at workers meeting in Pennsylvania. And they were at a workers meeting and us boys got a little antsy. Us boys got a little tired of just sitting there. And so we got permission to go to the restroom. Well, you know, you're going to make a big deal of that. I'm not just going to go there and come back. And so us boys went to the bathroom. I don't remember a lot. No big deal going to the bathroom. Done that a few times. But you know what happened? As I went to open the door and the door was locked shut. It was jammed. And immediately those claustrophobic feelings that had been reinforced by that Baptist pastor, all of a sudden I began to yell at the top of my lungs. I began to yell, please let us out of here, please. And we banged. The only problem was the pastor's meeting was way, way, way down the hall. Nobody could hear us. So I was just yelling at the top of my lungs, please help us out of here, please help us out of here. Finally, some other pastor colleague, can't remember who it was, but all I know is some other pastor bailed us out of the bathroom. That was wonderful. Fast forward, episode number three. Aren't you tired of these episodes already? <laughs> episode number three. At this time, I'm about 22 years of age, and I'm on a, a tour of the Holy Land, and we're in Jerusalem. And we had just had a nice full day of, of touring around Jerusalem, and so we were now back at the Five Star Hotel, ready to get some sleep, and another big day was coming the next day. And so we all jammed into the elevator. You know where the story is going, don't you? And so we're there, and you know, and the doors close, and they, you know, press the button, and we're not going anywhere. And it just stopped. It was just not going anywhere. And the doors were shut. Then here comes those claustrophobic feelings that I had as a kid. Let me tell you something, that elevator was very, very claustrophobic. I all, on a scale of one to 10, uh, what do you think it was at? I wanted to get out of there. I wanted to go free again. It seemed like eternity and finally they bailed us out. They had to actually come in. At, I remember from the top or something, I can't remember everything. All I know is I was thinking of one thing. I was praying, Lord, please, please. And then what happened? So now when I get on an elevator, what do you think I do? I pray. Well, episode number four. You want more episodes? One more. So by this time, I'm probably in my mid 40s and the doctor says, you need an MRI. Boy, that was a fast response. Not the new tech kind that's, you know, just, you know, your head's in it like, it's like, like about only this big, you know, you can 
feel around, it's nice and open. How many know about the open MRI? That's not the one this was. This was the tunnel. Everybody say tunnel. So they said, Mark, here's what you need to do. This, this, you're going you're gonna to slide underneath these cameras and you're going to be in there and just lay still and uh, you can press this button if you need to come out. I said, okay, I don't remember all the other instructions, I just remember that one. If you want out. And so here the conveyor belt begins to move. And it says, and I decided I'm going to close my eyes through this whole ordeal. So I just closed my eyes. I didn't want to see the walls all around me. All those claustrophobic feelings. Yeah, as a kid, they're all resurfaced, you know. And so then they didn't inform me of what was really going to happen. But then I heard like they wanted to do a test on my brain. Knock, 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 tick, 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 tick. I'm not doing it justice. But I remember this, it wasn't nice music. It was a knock, 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 tick, tick. They were trying to see if you're crazy or not. Okay, I am. And then, after a long time, it stopped. Mark? Yeah. Everything okay? Uh, yeah, um, you, you, you're okay for the rest of it? Yeah, so if I wanted to come out now, um, well then you would have to start it all over again. Okay, just checking. <laughs> Boy, was I tempted to say, no, doctor was wrong, can the whole thing. But I made it through with prayer. On a scale of one to 10, where do you think I was at wanting my freedom? Yeah, was it a 10? Episode, no, that's the last episode. How many have claustrophobic episodes in your life? How many? Oh yeah, there you go, there you go. We'll talk, we'll talk afterwards. Jesus said that a person who sins willfully and deliberately becomes a slave. They're not free. It's spiritual claustrophobia. Is there a sin in your life that you keep confessing it, keep confessing it, keep confessing it, but you don't have victory? This message is for you. If you are fully devoted to Jesus Christ and you know you're right with Jesus, this message is for you. If you know you're not right with God, this message is for you. But my prayer is that on a scale of one to 10, we're all at a 10 saying, Lord, I claim the freedom that you give us. The name of our ministry is, well, you would think it's Amazing Prophecies. That's what we do. We do Amazing Prophecies YouTube channel, Amazing Prophecies uh, seminars like this. But the name of our ministry is Forever Free Ministries. And it flows out of those verses that we read, Romans, uh, pardon me, John chapter eight, 31 to 36. If the Son sets you free, you are free indeed. I thank God tonight that although I am very imperfect, I know that I'm free. And I believe many of you already know that you're free. But let me tell you something, the devil doesn't care how long you've known the Lord and where you're at, he's going to try to enslave you again. I say this, don't go back to Egypt. You remember the children of Israel began to wander around the wilderness. And when they hit hard times, what happened? They would begin to have a desire, on a scale of one to 10, it was very, very high, to go back to Egypt because they thought the life was better there. But some like Joshua and Caleb, on a scale of one to 10, they were at a 10 wanting to go into the promised land. How many agree you can't have it both ways, Egypt or the promised land? How many are determined you want the promised land, amen? And so we named our children after the experience of going into the promised land. Caleb went in and they had to cross the Jordan River and named our daughter Jordan. That's, that's why I believe with all my heart 
God wants all of us to go into a promised land experience before we actually go into the promised land. I'm going to agree, we must first live the promised life, and then the promised land will be waiting for us. Amen. Take your Bible and turn with me to Revelation chapter 6. Revelation chapter 6. Revelation chapter 6. Are we ready to learn some things tonight? All right, Revelation chapter 6. Looking there at verses 14 and onward. Revelation chapter 6, pardon me, Revelation 6, verses 14 and onward. Then the sky receded, that is split apart, as a scroll when it is rolled up, and every mountain and island was moved out of its place. And the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave and every free man hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come, and who is able to what? Who, who's going to remain? Who's going to survive? Who's going to endure? Who's going to make it? Who's going to make it? And it says here, who's going to stand? The Bible makes it very clear that most people will not stand when Jesus comes because they didn't stand for Jesus. They can't stand when Jesus comes again. I want you to notice, they're the wicked, those who are not ready when Jesus comes, they try to hide themselves. Does it work? You can run, but you, can't, but you can't hide. The Bible makes it very clear that if we are in bondage to sin, when Jesus comes, it's too late. Who will be able to stand? Most people will not be ready when Jesus comes. Most professed Christians will not be ready when Jesus comes. We need to know that we are ready when Jesus, if Jesus were to come tonight, would you agree? We need to be ready, whether he comes tonight, next week, next year, next two years. We don't know the day or the hour. We just want to be ready. And so take your Bible and turn with me to Revelation 19. Revelation 19 about being ready. So we want to be free and know that the Son, Jesus Christ, has set us free and we're ready then. If he set us free, then we're ready. Look at Revelation chapter 19. So most will not be ready, but you can be ready. Ready or not, Jesus is coming. Revelation 19 verse 7. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory. For the marriage of the Lamb has come. And his wife has made herself what? Now how did she get ready? And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright. For the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Then he said to me, right, blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true sayings of God. So the Bible makes it very clear. The wife will make herself, that's the church, will make herself ready by making sure that she has put on the robe of Christ's righteousness. That robe that robe is a gift. That robe is a robe of Christ's righteousness. Would you agree Jesus never sinned? He has righteousness to give us. Our righteousness is filthy rags. Isaiah 64 verse 6 says that. So we need this robe if we're going to go to the marriage supper of the Lamb. We need this robe if we're going to be ready to stand when Jesus comes. Do you want to be ready? Yes or no? We want to be ready. On a scale of 1 to 10, how much do you want to be ready? So I want you to notice here, ready or not, Jesus is coming. So the wife is all about getting ready. How do you get ready? By being converted every single day. To be born again every single day. To fall in love with the Lamb every single day. To put on the robe of Christ's righteousness every single day. Would you agree? What God is looking for is a daily experience with Him. A daily walk with Him. Take your Bible and turn with me to Proverbs. Let's go to the Old Testament. We're going to the book of Proverbs chapter 4. Proverbs chapter 4. By the way, 30 days in a month and there's about 31 
chapters of Psalms, uh, pardon me, of uh, Proverbs. I recommend you read Proverbs. Okay, so look here at uh, Proverbs 4 and verse number 18. The Bible says, But the path of the just, that's the path of the righteous, the path of those who follow Jesus, the path of the just is like the shining sun that shines ever brighter unto the perfect day. When's the perfect day? The second coming of Jesus Christ. And the Bible says that as we're on this path towards heaven, how many agree there is a path that leads to heaven? And the Bible says that path gets brighter and brighter and brighter until the brightest day ever, the second coming of Jesus Christ. So if you're on the path, that leads to heaven, your path is going to shine brighter. You're going to have a closer walk with Jesus every single day. It's going to get closer and closer and closer, more intimate, more intimate. On a scale of one to 10, how much do you want to have a close walk with Jesus? Amen. So I want to go to the screen here. We're going to go back and forth between the screen and reading the scriptures and so forth. But, um, Jesus is coming sooner than most think. Most will be panic-stricken when Jesus appears in the sky. And I have a number of videos on my channel in which I cover this, this panic, this panic attack that most people will have when Jesus comes because they're not ready. While you and I should be watching for the signs of the second coming of Christ, how about making sure we see the unmistakable signs that prove we've been born again before he comes again? So are you ready, prepared for heaven, kingdom of God? Today, you are either dead in sin or dead to sin. I want you to just think about that. That's right from the book of Romans. Romans chapter 6, Romans chapter 7, Romans chapter 8. There's some homework for you. Romans 6, 7, and 8. Romans 6, 7, and 8. So today you're either dead in sin, in other words, you're not free, or you're dead to sin and free in Jesus. So today you are either in bondage or you have been set free. I'm repeating myself. Jesus answered them, Most assuredly I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. All right, you're with me thus far? So the Bible makes it very clear, either you're free or you're not free. And the way you know you're free is you search your heart and you say, Lord, is there any sin that's controlling me? You need to know the answer to that because Jesus can only set you free if you acknowledge every sin in your life and you confess it and you forsake it in the name of Jesus. So a slave to sin. This is not pleasant. Being a slave to sin, there's no peace in it. There's no joy in it. There's no happiness in it. It's a miserable life. And so what does the devil try to do? Try to have them preoccupied with the ways of the world and with the pleasures of the world and so forth so as to not focus on the desperate spiritual condition. And so today you are either spiritually blind or you can see things in a new light. Would you agree? When Jesus comes in, he opens your eyes. Is that true? He opens your eyes. And so today you are either still lost or you've been saved by the blood of the Lamb. And that's a daily experience. Today, you have either only have been born once, only been born once, or you're born again. Obviously, we've all been born once. But being born again, as if all over again, that is what God wants us to have. So how do you know for sure that you have been born again? Jesus answered Nicodemus in a nighttime conference. Nicodemus was a very respected, devout, religious leader. And he didn't want to visit Jesus during the daytime because he wanted to come under the cloak of night, kind of incognito, kind of going uh, off radar, where nobody could see that he was interested in what Jesus had to say. And so Jesus said to him, so now remember, this was a church attender. This was a church member. This was a church leader. And Jesus said to him, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is, what everybody? Born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And so he told this very 
highly respected, renowned religious leader, he said, you got to be born again. In other words, you're not saved. You're not free. You're religious, but you're not born again. You're not born again. And you won't be able to see the kingdom of God. Not only not see it spiritually, but literally you won't, you won't enter into the kingdom of God unless you're born again. Now, right then and there, Nicodemus could have said, goodbye, you've just offended me. You know what? We must say, Lord, whatever you have to say to me, even if it offends my flesh, Lord, I want to be open to whatever you say to me in your word. Amen? And so Nicodemus continued to listen. Nicodemus was receiving what Jesus was saying. You must be born again. And then he described how to be born again. What's that born again experience feel like, look like? The wind blows where it wishes and you hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from or where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the what, everybody? Of the Spirit. So he's saying, Nicodemus, you can't see the Spirit, but you can see the results. You can't see wind, but you see when the tree is blowing in the wind. So it is with everyone who's been born again. You don't see the Holy Spirit working, but you see the results. The wind blows. How many want the wind to blow through here tonight? God's word describes the new birth experience as a called, it calls it a resurrection. When a person dies, they need to be what? Resurrected. So the new birth experience is spoken of in this kind of language of resurrection, being awakened, being set free. And so you cannot assume anything about your standing before God. You must know for sure you are being saved. Now, we can say, am I saved right now? Well, by God's grace, as long as we are in Christ, yes. But that's a daily walk with God. I can't say, well, five years ago, I gave my heart to the Lord, so I'm good to go. No, every hour we need Jesus. Would you agree, if we're in Jesus, we're being saved, amen? We're in a safe condition, amen? And so, spiritual condition of the world and church in the last days. The Bible says in 2 Timothy 3, verse 5, the Bible says there that the last day church, the way people are going to look in, in, in among the Christian world, no power. They have a form of godliness, but deny the power thereof. What does that mean, have a form of godliness? They go through the motions, but their heart is not in it. They're not born again. They're not on fire for Jesus. They're lukewarm. Revelation 3, 14 to 21, the Bible describes God's people in the last days as being, Jesus calls them, lukewarm. And then in the Bible says in Matthew 25 that the church in the last days is asleep. And in 2 Timothy 4, 2 to 4, it says that Christians in the last days, by and large, and the world at large, they want to hear and they desire smooth preaching. They want more motivational type preaching than they do repentance and confession of sin and change of heart and to be born again and so forth. And so think about it. Let's add that all up. No power, lukewarm, asleep, desire smooth teaching. So the Bible makes it very clear in the last days, there's going to be a lot of form of godliness, but without, in other words, they got religion, but they don't have that close dynamic relationship with Jesus Christ without power. This is why many young people are not interested in church. Most young people could give a care about, about God about the Bible and about church. Why? Because they observe the church and they say, you know what, there's no power there. There's a lot of profession, but without the power. So this is a, this is a desperate situation. The Bible makes it very clear that more and more will depart from the faith. That's what the Bible teaches. Departing from the faith. I don't know about you, but I have a longing and a burden for young people today. And the way to win young people is that they see that you and I have power. Amen.
We have that power, the power of a changed life. In other words, would you agree the greatest demonstration of the power of God Almighty is being born again? When we are born again, again and again and again, day after day, converted, converted, re, this rebirth experience, falling in love with Jesus, this demonstrates to a skeptical generation and to a backslidden church, this demonstrates the power of God unto salvation. And so blind, bonded, lost, dead, darkness, paralyzed, or born again. And so I love this scripture in Ezekiel 36, 26. Read this together with me, would you? Nice and loud, turn up the volume, here we go. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. That's a miracle. That's a miracle. That's what God promises to do. You've heard the, somebody say, he'll never He'll never change. Oh, my dad, he'll never change. Oh, my mom, oh, my grandma, or oh, my aunt, or oh, my daughter, oh, my son, whoever, they'll never change. And it's usually said in a derogatory, negative way. But when we are following Jesus Christ, what we're saying, Lord, is I want you to constantly make changes in my life. Are you listening to this? A word that sums up this right here, change. Jesus promises to change us. And that's a daily experience. It's called sanctification. What is sanctification? He's making us holy. He's sanctifying us. That's a miracle. Watch this. Watch this. When he gives us a new heart every day and takes out of us that heart of stone, that, that, that hard heart that doesn't respond, that hard heart that, that wants it, you know, me, myself, and I. This is a miracle of conversion. And this is promised to us. So that your spouse can see God's changing you. Your children can see Jesus is converting you. Those around us will see we're not perfect, but we're growing in Christ and we're becoming more and more and more like Jesus. This is conversion. This is the experience that it is necessary to have if you and I are gonna pass the judgment, if you and I are gonna stand when Jesus comes in the sky. Only those who are born again, again and again and again, sanctification, growing in Christ, getting closer to Jesus, only those who have that forward motion, progressive experience with Jesus will be saved at last. If we're not growing, every day, Mark Fox and you, are getting better or, or worse. If we are getting better, it's because we're allowing the Lord to help us to fall in love with Him again and again and again. My wife and I have been married 34 years. I know you already heard that. Well, you hear it again. <laughs> and I can honestly say that we just keep falling in love with each other. We are in love with each other, and, but it, it grows. You can testify to it too. The walk with Jesus is all about, I love you, Jesus, because you love me first. 1 John 4, 19. Therefore, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, this is what Paul said about the new birth experience. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. And then he amplifies it. That's the way Paul wrote. He would say something, then he would amplify, amplify, amplify. Awesome writer. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have what, everybody? Come on. Passed away. Behold, some things, come on, shout out. All things have become new. Paul is saying, if you're in Christ, old habits, gone. Old ways, overcome. 
those old sins that were dragging you down like a ball of iron ball and chain. No, 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 no. When we've been set free, all things have become new. The things we used to love, we hate, and the things we used to hate, we love. We've been changed. Now, people will describe it in different ways. They say, well, what's gotten into you? That, that's good. <laughs> that's good. What's wrong with you? That's good. That's good. You're acting kind of strange. That's good. <laughs> it's good. And so, new creation, old things passed away. I'm asking you, how can you be born again if you're holding on to the same old sins? It's a daily experience. Daily experience. Those sins are always ready to be committed. That old carnal nature is always ready to take you down. Jesus alone can change our sinful hearts. And it's the greatest miracle. You say, Mark, what was the greatest miracle that Jesus ever worked? Wasn't it raising Lazarus from the dead? There's something even far greater than that. He changes your heart and mine. And so, can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard its spots? Then may you also do good, righteousness, who are accustomed or have this uh, habitual tendency to do evil. In other words, what it's saying there, what, what the Bible is saying is you can't change your heart. Only God can do that. But first you have to look in the mirror. Do you know the Bible is called the mirror? Specifically God's law is like a mirror. And it's important that we look in that mirror every single day and say, Lord, are there any changes? L listen, the way you know that you're getting closer to the Lord is you're honest with yourself and you're honest with God and you really want to know your condition. Lord, here I am. What changes do you want to work in me? Now, that can be a little overwhelming. Well, I guess you need a Savior. Because if you feel like, you know what, Mark, I think I'm doing just fine. You're not looking in the mirror. The Bible makes it very clear. We cannot change our hearts. But if our heart doesn't change, we'll be lost. So every day, think about it, from A to Z, our walk with God is all about Him working in my heart to bring about changes, changes. Aren't you glad that God will just work with you one day at a time? Aren't you glad, I could be even more precise, that He'll lead you just one step at a time? Aren't you glad that Jesus can handle you, yes or no? Yes, he can handle you. Is it Mark? You don't know me. Jesus does. Jesus does. And so, Jesus changes our hearts by his Holy Spirit and his Holy Word. So I want to go through some more of these signs, okay? You, number one, you feel yourself a sinner in need of a Savior. All right? And the tax collector, standing afar off, would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And Jesus said, that person went home justified. In other words, what Jesus is saying, if you feel yourself a sinner and you come to God in the name of Jesus and ask for forgiveness, you're justified, you're right with God, you're being converted. You, you and I must look at ourselves as sinful. Mark Fox is a sinful human being. That's who I am. But because I've given my heart to Jesus, He now dwells inside of me. I've been born again. But it, as I've mentioned, it's a daily walk, a daily walk with Jesus Christ. Every day I must say, God be merciful to Mark Fox, a sinner. But notice the difference not living in sin. You see, I can say, I am sinful. That's one thing. 
but I'm still accepted in the beloved, Ephesians 1, 6. But if I'm living in sin, I am not justified in that. I'm not justified in that. And so, number two, if you are experiencing the new birth experience on a daily basis, you're experiencing conversion, you have a deep sorrow for sin. Not only do you recognize you're sinful, and you ask God to be merciful to you, but secondly, you have a sorrow for sin. Now, I remember, you know, <laughs> another episode. Had a lot of episodes. <laughs> I was probably in the fourth grade, and I don't know, what, 10 years old, or whatever it was. And uh, got in a fight during, during a recess. Got in a fight with Timothy Empsey. Yeah, I remember his name. <laughs> we got in a tassel. Next thing I know, the teacher finds out and we are in big trouble. This was the kind of teacher, Mrs. Costa. You don't mess with her. She was a teacher, you know, she was a very nice woman, but you don't want to do something wrong like this. And so she said, okay, Mark, Tim, come, stand right here, face, face, face your class, face your class, put your arm around each other, put your arm around each other, and stay there until I say, I can't stand this kid. No, you're never going to, you're going to. Let me tell you something, it did do this. We never got in a fight again. <laughs> Number two, I tried to cover my back better. But this sorrow for sin is much deeper than that. A sorrow for sin. Take your Bible and turn with me to Zechariah 12. We're going to the Old Testament, Zechariah chapter 12. And this is tucked away in the Old Testament. It's almost there, the book of Malachi. But we're going to Zechariah chapter 12 and verse number 10. Zechariah 12 verse 10. Are we learning something? All right, Zechariah 12, 10. This is a promise and it's a prophecy. And I will pour on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. Then they will look on me, as this spirit of prayer is poured out, they will look on me, that is, look on Jesus, whom they pierced. They're going to look at the cross. They're going to look at what they've done to Jesus. And they're going to have deep sorrow for sin at what they've done to Jesus. Yes, they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son and grieve for him as one who grieves for a firstborn. So this is a promise and a prophecy that is to be fulfilled here at the Yakima Church, right here. This is to be experienced over these next weeks together. This is a promise and a prophecy. Does God want us to look to His Son Jesus on the cross and have a heart sorrow for sin and be mourning for sin and have the spirit of prayer, a spirit of seeking God with all your heart and with all your soul, with all your might? Amen? This is to be our experience over these next several weeks. You might be right here with your walk with God. God wants you to be up here. And I say this, with the anointing of the Holy Spirit, I say, rise up to higher heights with Jesus. It's time to come up higher. Would you agree? We need a higher experience with God. Come on now, we need a higher experience with God. We need an experience where are you content down here? Don't be content. Be, be spiritually agitated. Be spiritually uncomfortable until you come up higher. A higher experience. Because if you're content in your experience, you're not going to grow anymore. We must say, you know what? God's been with me today, but there's some things I've got to let go. And I've got to leave behind. If you want to go forward, you've got to leave some things behind. Is that true? Yes or no? you got to leave some things behind. You have a deep sorrow for sin. Only God can give us that. Where we actually cry. And maybe not always physical tears, but in our heart, we cry and we feel bad for the sins that we've committed. You know what happens today? 
If we're not careful, we sin and we don't even blink an eye. That's dangerous. That's very dangerous. If you find yourself sinning and it really doesn't bother you that much, that is a major problem. Understatement. We should hate sin the way that Jesus hates sin. It costs the life of Jesus Christ. And it's going to cost the wicked their life if they don't repent of the sin. God wants us to have a sorrow for sin. Are you willing to allow Jesus to do that in your heart, yes or no? Yes, amen, to put that sorrow in your heart. Because otherwise, you know what happens? No matter how powerful the preaching or how powerful the Bible study or how powerful your prayer, whatever, if you're not careful, you're gonna, the Holy Spirit's going to be seeking to move in your life and you're not budging, you're not moving. You're just stuck. God wants us to be moved by the power of the Holy Spirit. To have a sorrow for sin, would you agree? Then you make progress. Then Peter said to them, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, that is for the forgiveness of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That is, <laughs> that's good news. Listen to me. You can't be living for Christ without Christ. You know what happens? So many Christians are seeking to be a Christian without Christ. <laughs> oh, maybe dart up a prayer here and there, whatever, you know, a little snatch of the Bible here and there, but not a steady, healthy, strong intake of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is a gift. How many are thankful for the gift of the Holy Spirit of God? Without the Holy Spirit, you are left with your flesh and that's it. We need the gift of the Holy Spirit. Would you agree if the Holy Spirit is in your heart, He will make you holy. It's the Holy Spirit. Where the Holy Spirit goes, it makes things holy. Amen? And so I want you to notice here, repent. Repentance is not a left turn. Repentance is not a right turn. Repentance is a U-turn. Okay, here's an analogy. Driving along the highway of life. Driving along in your car and you see all these dazzling lights, neon lights flashing, billboards flashing, you know, gambling casino and movie house and pleasure spots and uh, bingo here and flea market there. You see all these big things, exciting things and so forth. And uh, you're going along and you're thinking, oh, what am I going to do next and so forth? And uh, where do I want to stop? What pleasure do I want now and so forth? And then all of a sudden your eyes catch sight of a person with uh, long hair and a beard, and you're like, that's Jesus. And he's hitchhiking. And you're like, wow, we, that's Jesus, he's hitchhiking. And so you just passed him, you thought, man, I, I, he needs a ride. So you pull over, and you're looking, and here comes, here comes Jesus. Here comes Jesus, and you're Roll down the window and so forth. Where, where are you going? C come on in. Jesus, that's you. Yeah, c c come on in. Come on in. And Jesus says, no. And he comes around to the driver's side. Almost like a cop. <laughs> and you roll down your window. Uh, Jesus, you want a, a ride? I want to drive. Like, you want to drive my car? <laughs> yeah. Well, Jesus, that's the least I can do. Go ahead. You move over. And Jesus, first thing he does, he doesn't make a left turn. He doesn't make a right turn. He makes a U-turn. And just as he's about to make that U-turn, he says, there's where you were heading. And you look, he says, look, Clint, and he opens your eyes and the path that you were on, all those pleasures, there's fires of hell. And he completely turns you around and he shows you now we're going to heaven. How many want to give Jesus the wheel? Give Jesus the wheel. 
Give Jesus the wheel. Hallelujah. That's what Jesus said. No, no, no. But people are like, well, Jesus, I'll, I'll bargain with you a little bit. They want to play mind games. They want, to, they want to, you know, kind of let the Lord have a little more slack in their life, but not, not completely. There's no joy in that. The only joy is when self dies. When self dies, then we really live. Amen? That's when we really live. So we need to repent. Repentance of sin. Turning our heart to Jesus Christ. And so we keep going. Him, God. And by the way, by the way, notice it says repent and be baptized. Some of you need to be baptized. But don't even think about baptism if you're not turning away from your sin and you're saying, Jesus I surrender all to you and you're experiencing conversion, then be baptized. But don't, water's not going to change you. It is, a, it is a representation that you have been born again. Not perfect, but you're born again and you know you've been born again. Amen? And so, him, God, is exalted to his right hand to be prince and savior to give repentance, there's that gift, give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. You see, th th this, is, this is very important to understand. Think with me. Many people think they have to repent and then Jesus will do this and Jesus will do that. In other words, there's things you have to do. Well, listen to me. You and I cannot repent of sin in our own strength. You don't repent and then come to Jesus. You come to Jesus and say, Lord, I want genuine repentance. Would you please give that to me? That's true repentance. How many times have you said sorry for your sins? You go right back to it like a dog to the vomit. What we need is true repentance. Is this making sense? We need true repentance. And that is a gift. What does this say here? To give repentance. Friends, that's, a, that's outrageous good news. That's gospel good news. They don't give you repentance where you hate what Jesus hates and you love what Jesus loves. And notice when he gives you repentance, right there with it is forgiveness because he can't forgive you unless you're willing to repent. But the repentance is a gift, the forgiveness is a gift, the Holy Spirit is a gift, but we must cooperate. Our part is to say, Lord, I'm willing to die. That's receiving Jesus Christ, my friends. You turn your back on sin. You don't turn your back on Jesus. You turn your back on sin, you say, sin, no way, not this time, no more. The problem is, is we want to make sin feel as comfortable as possible. How many agree sin will not have dominion over us because we are set free in the name of Jesus Christ? You give up all sinful addictions through the power of Jesus Christ. Smoking, drinking, drugs, porn, whatever it is, gossip, bitterness, you can't hold on to any of that junk and still be right with God. You must say, I let it go. I let it go. If you were in a rowboat and you're in the middle of a lake and you have a lead ball chained to your feet, to one of your feet, and you fall out. It doesn't matter how much you try to swim to shore or try to get back in the boat, you're going in one direction. You and I cannot be saved in sin. We are saved from sin. Would you agree? Jesus clips off. We've been shackle free now. How many are thankful? He breaks the bonds breaks the bonds. Look to your neighbor and say, I'm free. So many are self-deceived about their heart condition and they're standing before God. Whoever has been born of God does not sin 
for his seed remains in him and he cannot sin because he's been born of God. Now what part of that don't we understand? If you're born again, you're not living in willful, known, deliberate sin. You've been set free. I'll read it again. Whoever has been born of God does not sin. I'm afraid that by and large Christians of today are receiving a half-baked gospel. How many want the whole truth and nothing but the truth? No more fleshly teaching, no more smooth teaching. How many want rock solid, good old fashioned revival messages, amen? And the Bible makes it very clear, if you've been born of God, you will not be living in deliberate sin. You've been set free and you know you've been set free. Every day, he cannot sin because he's been born of God. Is it clear, born of God says, sin, you do not have a home in my heart anymore. Come on, give a hand clap to Jesus. By the way, can Jesus keep you from sinning for at least 10 minutes? Huh? How many can handle at least 10 minutes without sinning? All right, let's try it. How about a whole hour without cherishing any evil thought? It doesn't mean something bad won't come into your mind. It just means you're not. How many can... Think you can handle at least five hours without sinning. It's getting really quiet. I don't know what the what the hang up is here, but they're like, we're not committing to anything, right? Can Jesus keep you from sinning for one day? Absolutely. Absolutely. You can still feel that you're sinful but you've been set free from sin. So it's not a presumptuous confidence. It's a confidence knowing what Jesus said he would do, he does. The problem is that we don't take God at his word. We mock God by not believing his promises. Would you agree when God gives a promise, our life depends upon, our eternal life depends upon believing what he said. Believing what he said. Remember the woman caught in the act of adultery? I say, where were the men? Where were the men? Obviously, she was caught in the act of adultery. Where's the guy? Or the other men and so forth. Would you agree this woman was set up? And this woman and others like her ended up loving Jesus more than those that were accusing and Jesus said to her, you know, she was caught in the act of adultery, thrown before Jesus. They were wanting to stone her. And Jesus said to her, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Now, was Jesus joking? What he was saying is, don't go back to living in any known sin, and in that case, adultery. Don't go back to that lifestyle. You're free. You're free. Now, friends, this is good news. Jesus says the same thing to you and I tonight. I don't condemn you. Leave your life of sin. Sin no more. Then why do we sin? There's no excuse for it. There's absolutely no excuse for sin. Well, then why do we sin? Because we take our eyes off Jesus. And it's very easy to sin. You don't have to even try. The reason we sin is because we turn from Jesus to ourself. Remember, Peter was walking on water. Can you imagine that? When's the last time you walked on water? <laughs> he walked on water because he had his eyes on Jesus. What happened when he took his eyes off of Jesus? He began to drown. And what did he say? A very short prayer. Save me, Lord. Sometimes short prayers get really fast answers. <laughs> and Jesus was there to rescue him. 
Do you want to walk on water? Do you think you can walk on water for at least an hour? Everything depends upon looking to Jesus, keeping your eyes on Jesus Christ. We're in warfare. The dragon is enraged with you because you profess to be a follower of Jesus Christ. Number three, total surrender and faith in Jesus as Lord and Savior is a sign or fruit of conversion. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God to those who believe in his name, to believe in Jesus Christ. You are God's children. Now think about that. You have a father. You are his son. You are his daughter. Think about it. We are children of God. And we are going to live forever. Forever. How do I know for sure that Jesus is living in my heart? <laughs> All that we've been saying. You must believe God's word to be saved. You can't think, I hope I'm going to be saved. Or I... You need to believe his word. Have faith in God's promises. You desire to die daily in order to live for Jesus. You can't live for Jesus and live for yourself. One, one must die. You can't serve two masters. Matthew 6, 24. It requires a struggle to surrender all to Jesus, but it is worth it. Amen? Number four, strong desires to be like Jesus. What's the word? What do you call yourself? A Christian. What's the root word? Christ. What does that mean? You want to be like Christ. That's why you named Christian. How many have ever noticed this phenomenon? That the longer some married couples live together and are married together, the more they begin to talk alike and look alike. And a matter of fact, one is able to finish the person, the other, the spouse's sentences. They don't even have to talk. They know what they're going to say. Please let your spouse talk. <laughs> but you know, the longer we're married to Jesus Christ, the more we look like him, the more we talk like him. Come on now. And so... He who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as he walked. We walk and talk like Jesus. 1 John 2, verse 6. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Philippians 2, verse 5. To have the mind of Christ, to think like Christ. We are to be one with Christ. Read John 17. We're to be one with him, to abide in him and he in us. That's close. Listen. Jesus is closer to us because he lives in our heart. Oh, if only I could have been there 2,000 years ago and seen Jesus. Yes, I wish I was there too. But you know what? He was closer to the disciples after he went back to heaven because then he could come through his Holy Spirit. How many are thankful? Christ in you, the hope of glory. Amen? And so the Bible says here, have the mind of Jesus Think like Jesus. Think his thoughts. Oh, how would Jesus think? That's the converted life. Think like, what would Jesus think? If we would be habitually doing that, what would Jesus do? What would Jesus say? What would Jesus think? Number five. You have a thirst and hunger to know Jesus better, to be closer to him each day. You thirst. You thirst and hunger for more of the presence of Jesus. Have you ever been like really, really thirsty? How many have ever gone a week without any water? You wouldn't be here. <laughs> have you ever discovered that you can't live long without water? We are to thirst for the presence of Jesus. And on a scale of 1 to 10, how thirsty should we be for Jesus? Thirsting for more of his presence. When you wake up in the morning, you thirst for the word of God. You thirst for Jesus. You thirst for his presence. That's right. And so on the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me. 
He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. John 7, 37 and 38. Now that's very interesting because this was during the Feast of Tabernacles. And it was a beautiful festival, an annual festival that they would have, different rituals and so forth that were very impressive and so forth. But at the end of it, in the last day, Jesus stands up and said, are you still thirsty? And that got people's attention. In other words, what Jesus was saying is, okay, you've gone through these different uh, festivals and so forth, but are you really, really, really thirsting for something that only I can give? You know, when I gave my heart to Jesus at the age of 19, I experienced a peace that I've never experienced before. He satisfies a thirst. He satisfies a thirst that the world cannot satisfy. And so, our time waning. Having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, through the word of God, which lives and abides forever. How are we born again? This book will change your life. Jesus took time to bleed. We should take time to read. Say it with me. Jesus took time to bleed. We should take time to read. He gave us his word. You have to turn off the social media. You have to turn off the movies. You have to turn off. You have to say no to some things if you're going to say yes to getting into the word of God. Feasting on the word of God thirsting for the revelations of Jesus in his word. God speaks to us in his word. Amen. And so we're born again through the word of God. In other words, as you get into the word of God, it changes you. Your experience, born again experience. You love the Bible, the word of God. You love to read it and hear it and meditate on it. If you are truly being converted, you love the Bible. Nobody has to say, you know, you should read your Bible. You should read your Bible. If you're born again, you want to tell others, read your Bible. But you, when you pray, go into your room. My, my wife and Jordan and Caleb made a scripture song. Maybe sometime they'll sing it. I don't know. But anyway, they did a scripture song. And here it is, Matthew 6, 6. But you, when you pray, go into your room. And when you have shut your door, pray to your Father who is in the secret place. And your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. You know the secret to prayer is secret prayer. I urge you, take an hour in prayer and Bible study every day, right there in the morning, if at all possible. Take that time with God. Jesus is our example. Jesus spent whole nights in prayer. Jesus spent hours in prayer. He is our example. We need to be much in secret prayer. There is no power except in Jesus to change our heart and to make us holy. You realize that secret prayer is the top priority in being close to God. You realize that without prayer, you have no life. None. Our life in Christ is about being in communication with him, being in communion with him. Number six, you love and seek to please Jesus with all of your heart. You want to do what honors him. You want to do what pleases him, not the world. And whatever we ask, we receive of him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are what? Pleasing in his sight. Pleasing in his sight. And so you now live for Jesus and not for self. And he died, one of my favorite scriptures in the Bible, he died for all that those who live should live no longer for who? For themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. It's no longer me, myself, and I. Not I, but Christ. We die to self and want Jesus to have full control, mind, body, soul. We belong to Jesus Christ. Live no longer for themselves, but live for the one who died for them. Number seven, you have the fruits of the Holy Spirit. This is how you know your experience conversion. You have love for people. Now remember, we're all growing. We're, all, we're growing, but you know you're following Jesus as he helps you to have self-control and patience and kindness and goodness and joy 
and peace. These are fruits of the Holy Spirit, Galatians 5, 22, 23. And so the unchristlike become Christ-like. The unloving become loving. The impure become pure. The drunkard becomes sober. The revengeful becomes uh, forgiving. The bitter become better. The depressed become joyful. The empty become filled. The unfaithful become faithful. The impatient become patient. The unkind become kind. Would you agree? This is what it means to be converted. This is what it means. The restless become restful. The worldly become godly. The compromising become uncompromising. The double-minded become single-minded. The rough become gentle. The hot-tempered become mild. The timid become courageous. Is Jesus changing our heart? People around you will see that you are a changed person. Not perfect, but far different from the one you used to be. Number eight, the world has lost its attraction to you if you have been born again. You're just simply not interested. The movies you used to love, you now hate. The movies you used to think there was uh, no problem with you, uh, now you find them offensive. The pop music you love, you now realize Jesus does not love. You love Jesus now. The hip hop stars you used to follow, you realize you must follow Jesus now. Are you truly born again? Are you a changed person? Are you a new person? Show me what you love to watch. Let me check out your, your social media um, pattern. We're in spiritual warfare, friends. We have to be born again and we have to fight for it. Number nine, you desire to lead others to accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Therefore, you are my witnesses, says the Lord, that I am God. God wants to use you to be a witness for him. How many have a mouth? You have it covered. <laughs> use your mouth for God. But is that the only way we witness? How about just smiling at somebody? How about giving somebody some money that might need it? How about baking a, boat, a, a, a loaf of bread for somebody? We need to witness in many ways. Number 10, time waiting. Number 10, we got to close. You are determined to be an overcomer of all sin and temptations. They overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives to the death. How many want to live for Jesus every day of your life from now on? Please stand with me. Tonight, we have met with God. We are in the presence of Jesus. On a scale of one to 10, how much do you want Jesus? How many want to say, Lord, only you know if it's really at a 10, but Lord, would you please put a number 10 in my heart that I long for you more than ever? How many want to raise your hand and say, Lord, put it, make it a number 10, make it a number 10. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I pray only you can make us desire you and long for you and trust you at a 10. Please, Lord, whatever it takes, do whatever you want in our heart. With every head bowed and eye closed, oh, give your heart to Jesus right here, right now. He loves you. He died for you. And I pray, Lord, as we go home now, thank you that we don't go home alone. We have you, Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Amen.